Now let us press forward and apply the insights of Trinitarian perichoresis to God's relation to Adam in creation and in covenantal condescension and what it entails. There is a parallel between the eternal movement of autothean perichoresis on the one side and the historical movement in the work of special creation and the act of special providence that places Adam in the estate of innocency with his eschatological end in the estate of glory. So let me outline and remind us of the three points that Voss has made and then turn them toward the service of reformed federalism, its doctrine of image endowment, covenant of works, and its theology of two ages or two estates before the fall, innocency and glory. The eternal movement of procession and perichoresis within the Trinity supplies the exemplary cause for the historical movement in God's relation to Adam in the special work of creation, image endowment, and in the special act of providence, the covenant of works. And so you can see that the historical movement is a twofold movement mirroring the twofold processions. Secondly, the internal circulation of twofold procession and perichoresis grounds the designed two age advancement of Adam from fellowship with God in the estate of innocency to fellowship with God in the estate of glory. Now, when we grasp these features, we can understand, third, how the reciprocal indwelling of Trinitarian persons in the Godhead provides the theological rationale for the covenantal communion bond conferred upon Adam in creation and in that special act of providence that we call covenant. Mirroring by divine design, the eternal movement and eternal circulation, internal circulation of Trinitarian processions within the Godhead, we find two replications of it. A condescended twofold relation between God and Adam in creation and covenant, and a designed two age advancement of that relationship from innocency to glory. And so here we can see uh, corresponding to the eternal movement of the Trinity in perichoresis, in the twofold procession of Son and Spirit, you have twofold historical movements, special creation and special providence, innocency and glory. Now this way of speaking offers a modification and hopefully a clarification of what Cornelius Van Til termed the representational principle, what I developed in the earlier modules on Van Til for Reformed Academy and what was put in the Trinitarian Theology of Cornelius Van Til volume that Reform Forum published. Now, in order to address Thomas more directly, and to appropriate his own language and reform it in the service of federalism. Let me put it this way. The relationship between Trinitarian perichoresis on the one side and the twofold relation in special creation and covenant and the twofold estates, innocency and glory, offers a representation of perichoresis. The twofold movement of Trinitarian perichoresis is represented in the twofold relation, special creation, special providence, image endowment and covenant, and the two age movement from innocency to glory. So let me apply in some form now this autothean perichoresis, as we've defined it from Voss, to the image of God, special creation, and to the covenant of works, that 
special act of providence that addresses the image-bearing creature with an eschatological promise of advancement to glory. Let's speak first then about here in special creation, let's speak about image of God, the Imago Dei. Adam's image endowment replicates on a creaturely level the eternal movement of procession and perichoresis in the Trinity. And please note this, this differs fundamentally from Thomas's doctrine of the image. For Thomas, there are capacities conferred on the image bearer, knowledge, replicating the personal property of the Son, freedom, replicating the personal property of the Spirit, but those are rational and volitional capacities that are inscribed on Adam. Communion with the living persons is suspended on the economy of grace. It is deferred until a supernatural, super added gift is given by which that religious relation with the living persons is achieved. Voss calls that religious externalism. The Reformed doctrine of the image of God teaches what I will call, to try to advance Voss, religious internalism. The religious relation is internal to the image endowment. How? Because the eternal communion of Trinitarian persons in their internal circulation and mutual personal indwelling, that reality is replicated in the image endowment itself. Adam is created in religious fellowship with God that does not need additional, super-added, supernatural grace in order to achieve such a relation. And so there's a fundamental difference here. Perichoretic communion, mutual in being, is replicated in the work of special creation. And so let me make these points. First, the confessional reform doctrine on the image of God teaches that natural religious fellowship and not bare natural capacities, Pace Thomas, is given in the creational image endowment itself. Gerhardus Voss observed this in his Reformed Dogmatics, that the image of God consists in fellowship with God, RD 2 to uh, 12 through 14. God conferred upon Adam in image endowment moral agency, moral excellency, as both subserve his religious relation to God. Such fellowship flows from image endowment. Such fellowship is included in image endowment. For God to confer the image of God on Adam was for God to confer himself upon Adam. Living Trinitarian persons in natural religious fellowship with the image-bearing creature. That fellowship is naturally gifted. This view of naturally gifted fellowship with God distinguishes the Reformed view of the image of God from the Roman Catholic view, according to Voss, and Voss is correct. On the Roman Catholic view, there's no such thing as a natural bond of religious fellowship. We've already seen that in Thomas. There are natural capacities conferred by which the creature, if he uses them correctly, if Adam used his natural faculties of reason and freedom correctly, he could come to a knowledge of God but that knowledge of God and that fellowship with God is not con-created. Thomas makes this explicit. Bellarmine makes this explicit. Traditional Roman Catholicism, Catholicism makes this explicit. Grace, remember, elevates man above his created nature to participate in the divine processions and in that gracious modality have fellowship with living Trinitarian persons. 
You have to remember, Emery said, once having reminded us that the creature receives a likeness to God communicated in creation, Thomas turns to the causality of the divine processions within the return that God effects in grace. Point is quite simple. Creation for Rome, for Thomas, places the creature into a rational and volitional likeness to God, patterned after the Son and the Spirit. Grace puts the creature into a higher mode of knowledge and love, patterned after the exemplary cause of the reditus of the persons. Creation is an exitus. Grace is an ontologically elevated reditus to God. And so, by nature, according to Thomas and according to traditional Roman Catholicism, Adam was given the capacity to know and the capacity to seek God, but he required grace given above and beyond his nature in order to have a living, religious relation to God. And Voss says that living religious relation to God is conferred by image endowment without any super added, supernatural, deifying grace that confers a religious relation. The religious externalism of Rome and Thomas is replaced by the religious internalism of the deeper Protestant conception, natural religious fellowship given in image endowment. Now, a second entailment is that the ethical orientation of Adam as the image of God was entirely inclined toward God in concreated knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. Original righteousness and holiness were created in Adam, given to him in the work of special creation, so that original righteousness, along with knowledge and holiness, is a concreated and natural endowment that God gave to Adam as the image of God. It is supernaturally given by God, but it is natural to Adam and concreated within him. It is not super added, a gift above and beyond what was created in him, but it is concreated. Now, I need to make explicit here that for Rome, original righteousness is super added and supernaturally given above and beyond the image endowment conferred by the special work of creation. This is yet a second way of showcasing Rome's religious externalism in distinction from the religious internalism of the deeper Protestant conception. Listen to what Bavink says. Between the Roman Catholic doctrine of the image of God and the Reformation, there is a profound difference that makes itself felt over the whole field of theology. The dispute concerned the question of whether that original righteousness was natural or at least in part supernatural. Reformed theologians asserted the former. By that, they did not mean to say that this original righteousness arose automatically from human nature, understood in the sense of a union of spirit and matter, nor that it could not be called a gift, even of God's grace in a broad sense. Rather, they used this term to maintain the conviction that the image of God, that is, original righteousness, was inseparable from the idea of man as such and that it referred to the normal state, the harmony, the health of a human being. That without it, a human cannot be true, complete, or normal. When man loses the image of God, he does not simply lose a substance while remaining fully human. Rather, he becomes an abnormal, sick, spiritually dead human being, a sinner. He then lacks something that belonged to his nature just as a blind man loses his sight. 
a deaf man his hearing, and a sick man his health. In Rome's view, a human being can lose supernatural righteousness and still be good, true, complete, sinless human, without a natural justice that in its kind is without any defect. But according to the Protestant theologians, a human being cannot. There is no intermediate state between man as image of God and man as sinner. He is either a son of God, his offspring, his image, or he is a child of wrath, dead in sins and trespasses. When that human being again by faith receives that perfect righteousness in Christ, that benefit is indeed a supernatural gift, but it is supernatural as an accident, incidentally. He regains that which belongs to his being, like a blind man who receives his sight. R.D. 2, 551. I give you that quote to dispel existing confusion that might exist. The Reformed teach that original righteousness is concreated and natural. Original righteousness is intrinsic to the image of God. It is intrinsic as created, and when it is lost, man becomes dead in sin. But the Roman Catholics teach, including Thomas, that the original righteousness is super added and supernatural. Original righteousness is extrinsic to the image of God given in special creation. It is extrinsic and super added, and it can be lost without bringing fundamental corruption to human nature. The differences between the Reformed and the Roman Catholic on this point, according to Bavink, are profound and, quote, makes itself felt over the whole field of theology. And so point one, Natural religious fellowship, concreated and given in the work of special creation. Point two, original righteousness, concreated and natural, not super added and supernatural. Its loss brings slavery to sin, not simply the loss of mere supernatural accidents, as Thomas and Rome teach. Third, the image endowment that God gave Adam in the work of special creation was eschatologically ordered by that work. That is, Adam, by virtue of bearing the image of God, was ordered to advance beyond his estate in Eden, to advance beyond his estate of innocency. Paul, as he interprets Genesis 2-7 in 1 Corinthians 15-45, makes this explicit. If there is a natural, then there is a spiritual, even before the fall. The potential of the eschatological body was gifted in the creation of the natural body. Regarding this verse and focusing on 1 Corinthians 15, 45, Voss comments in his Pauline eschatology that seminal and unsurpassed work in this way. Quote, The apostle was intent on showing that in the plan of God from the outset, provision was made for a higher kind of body. The abnormal body of sin and the eschatological body are not so logically correlated that one can be postulated from the other, but the world of creation and the world to come are thus correlated, the one pointing forward to the other. End of quote. It's Pauline Eschatology, page 169, footnote 19. Paul argues that the mere existence of the natural body the special creational endowment of the image of God on Adam, body and soul, 
entails a provision for a spiritual body, a body advanced beyond probation to confirmed righteousness, holiness, knowledge, and glory. Put in light of 1 Corinthians 15, 47, if there is a man of earth, then there must also be a man of heaven. Adam's indirect access to God on earth was designed to advance to direct access to God in heaven. Put in light of 1 Corinthians 15, 49, if there is a natural image that brings into view Adam in a provisional fellowship with God in Eden, there was from the outset an image endowment that would bring him beyond earthly probation to heavenly glory. Now, of course, after the fall, the spiritual body belongs to Christ as raised. The man of heaven is Christ as ascended. And the image of Jesus Christ is conferred on his church in spirit-forged union with Christ. But the point that Voss makes, Gaffin makes, Klein makes, the Westminster Standards make, is that the eschatological potential to advance to glory was concreated in Adam as the image of God in the work of special creation. With no additional, extrinsic, infused grace brought into the picture. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 and following, when interpreted properly, destroys the religious externalism of Roman Catholic nature-grace dualism. Fourth, the creational production and consummate perfection of the image of God comes by a twofold work of the Spirit. A work in creation and a work in consummation. Genesis 2 7 refers to the Spirit breathing the breath of life into Adam and conferring upon him life in fellowship with God on earth in Eden under covenant before the fall. Protological life was conferred upon Adam, breathed into Adam by the supernatural agency of the Spirit. And so if you're looking for the supernatural character of the relation from God to Adam, it's found in God's pneumatic work of breathing life into Adam. But once breathed, Adam has natural religious fellowship, original righteousness, and eschatological potential built into him by virtue of that work. But 1 Corinthians 15.45, interpreting Genesis 2.7, envisions a second breath of the Spirit. What do I mean by that? Let me put it in two ways. Had Adam remained upright, had Adam offered ex pacto meritorious obedience to God, had Adam destroyed the work of the devil in perfect obedience to God, the Spirit would have breathed upon him a second time and advanced him from probation to glory, from innocency to glory, from mutable righteousness to confirmed righteousness. And we know this because what Adam failed to attain because of sin has been attained by the work of the second and last Adam, Jesus Christ, who offered perfect obedience satisfied the wrath of God, and having passed his probation as a federal head, the Spirit has breathed on him that second breath of resurrection life. The Spirit who breathed protological life into the first Adam by creation 
has breathed eschatological life into the last Adam by resurrection. And in his representative capacity, the Son, who has the Spirit without measure, he has become life-giving Spirit, confers that second breath of eschatological life in the Spirit upon his people. This twofold breathing activity of the Spirit drives the eschatology of the two estates of Adam in innocency and glory. The first breath of the Spirit supernaturally conferred upon Adam protological life, original righteousness, concreated religious fellowship with God. The second breath of the Spirit pending his meritorious obedience under covenant, ex pacto merit, would have supernaturally conferred on him eschatological life, confirmed righteousness, and the consummation of concreated religious fellowship with God. This twofold work of the Spirit, this two age work of the Spirit, would produce and consummate Adam's fellowship with God under the covenant of works. The image of God, Adam's creation in protological life, original righteousness and fellowship with God, was designed to advance to eschatological life. But now, how does that to Adam eschatology, how does that work of special creation and covenant, how does that estate of innocency ordered to an estate of glory, how does that relate to Trinitarian perichoresis? Think of it this way. The eternal movement in twofold procession within the Trinity grounds the historical movement in a twofold relation and a two estate eschatology. The eternal movement grounds the historical movement and the twofold procession grounds the twofold relation and the two distinct estates. Adam and his historical advancement as the image of God, arriving at beatitude through perfect obedience, would constitute a covenant historical replica of the eternal movement internal circulation, and mutual personal indwelling in the Trinity. But that moves us to consider, secondly, the covenant of works. Because it's only through covenantal condescension that the image of God can advance his estate to beatitude. Let me make two observations now about Adam's ex pacto obedience under the supernaturally revealed positive terms of the covenant of works and the corresponding supernatural work of the Spirit that would advance Adam to beatitude in the estate of glory. First, the supernatural terms of the covenant of works would address Adam as the image of God and provide the revealed path that he must follow to realize the eschatological potential created within him as the image of God. The created image of God, as such, without any superadded or supernatural grace, has eschatological potential within it. There's an intrinsic eschatological potency in the image of God. Adam was created, in other words, as a dynamic, a state-traversing image bearer. He was created with the potential to advance his estate. And the covenant of works was given by God precisely to give fruition to Adam as the image of God. This is the substance, properly understood, 
of Westminster Confession 7.1. Adam could advance his state and have fruition of God through obedience to a supernaturally revealed special act of providence that we call the covenant of works. So, the eschatological provision of the natural image requires the eschatological promise of the covenant. The covenant of works, the covenant of life, the covenant of creation. Adam's eschatological end cannot be realized apart from the covenant of works. But Adam's ex pacto, meritorious obedience to the positive terms of that covenant is the path of advancing natural religious fellowship to consummation, of advancing original righteousness to confirmation, and advancing probation on earth to Sabbath rest in heaven. But second, if Adam obeyed under covenant, the Spirit who conferred upon him natural communion with God in creation would perfect that communion bond with God in consummation. The same Spirit who breathed protological life upon Adam and formed him in the image of God would have, had he remained upright, breathed eschatological life upon him and advanced his estate. The special act of providence in the covenant of works holds forth eschatological promise and that promise is realized by perfect obedience and through the supernatural agency of the Spirit of God. Adam's eschatological end is not attained by his own efforts simpliciter. He must obey. His obedience is ex pacto meritorious. But the advancement of his estate is suspended on a second breath of the Spirit, a supernaturally wrought advancement of his estate, translating him from earthly probation into heavenly Sabbath rest. And so, as we reflect on this, the twofold relation of the triune God to Adam in the special work of creation, image of God, and in the special act of providence, covenant of works, is a replication of the twofold processional dynamics of perichoresis. And so Francis Turretin, when he speaks of perichoresis, describes perichoresis as a personal embrace and mutual permeation of the persons in the Trinity. That mutual embrace is replicated in creation and covenant and advanced by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now with these insights in place, let me just make one final concluding observation about the estate of innocency and the estate of glory, the second point here. First historical movement that replicates perichoresis is special creation and special providence. The second main historical movement before the fall that would replicate perichoresis, the movement from innocence to glory. The twofold processions as eternal movements in the Trinity are replicated in these twofold acts and works in history, these two estates in history. So let me just talk for a moment about the two processions in the Trinity and the two estates of Adam before the fall. Adam's twofold movement from the estate of innocency to the estate of glory further represents on a creaturely level the twofold processional perichoresis of the Son and Spirit. You see, 
the twofold internal circulation of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in procession is the beatitude of the Trinity. Adam's traversing from the estate of innocency to the estate of glory through ex pacto obedience and the supernatural work of the Spirit would be the rational creatures, the image-bearing creatures' beatitude. And so we can say something along these lines. The internal circulation of Trinitarian persons in beatitude provides the archetype for Adam's covenant historical advancement from innocency to glory. The circular movement in the Trinity grounds the linear movement of the image bearer in history. Second, this representation differs in at least two ways from Thomas. First, Voss teaches that the special work of creation brings about a communion between the living persons of the Trinity and Adam as the natural image of God, wholly apart from superadded supernatural grace. I've already made that point. It's a fundamental and categorical difference. Second, Voss teaches that the special work of providence in the covenant of works, supplies Adam with the means to advance his estate by meritorious obedience through the second breath of the Spirit without the need for ontologically reproportioning grace. That point needs all the emphasis that we can give it. Wholly apart from super-added supernatural grace given to supplement what is lacking in the image endowment, Adam can advance through ex pacto meritorious obedience. Then the Spirit brings to full actualization what is concreated within him. But what is that consummation? Listen, it's a Spirit-breathed realization, a spirit-breathed actualizing of what was concreated in Adam naturally, not what was super-added and supernatural by way of deification. And so the historical and linear movement of Adam in the twofold relation, special creation, special providence, and the two distinct estates of innocency and glory. These linear movements in time are replicas of the eternal movement, internal circulation, and mutual in-being, personal indwelling of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now what this leads us to do next is expand our theology of the two estates in light not only of Trinitarian perichoresis and the eternal movement within the Godhead, but on the creation of the upper register, the heaven temple in the absolute beginning, where you find the primal epiphany of the Son as incarnate at the right hand of the Father and the Spirit as in doxate, filling that heaven temple with the glory of the coronating Father, the incarnate Son, and the indoxate Spirit as the realm of creaturely beatitude in covenantal fellowship with God.